Welcome back to the news today. In a world defined by conflict, the words I'm sorry are rarely uttered by politicians and diplomats, especially major power brokers. But sometimes uh, geopolitical stars align and disputes can indeed be reconciled. Today, Japan reached a deal with South Korea, which will see Tokyo compensate so-called World War II comfort woman in Israel. Prime Minister Netanyahu recently expressed regret to Turkey for the loss of life in 2010 Mavi Marmara incident. And modern Germany has uh, repeatedly conveyed uh, rumors uh, uh, for the atrocities of the Holocaust. Here with me to discuss uh, these and other historical rapprochements are uh, Professor Moshe Zimmerman, historian, thank you very much uh, for uh, coming, and Dr. Uh, Rafi Netz, uh, Managing Director of the International Summer Program in Conflict Resolution at the Bar Ilan University. Good evening. Thank you very much uh, for joining me. You know, uh, after so many years, uh, eventually, only to say we're sorry, we will give you eight million dollars, and the United States intervening in the middle and saying you need to do that. This is it and everything is deleted and now everybody can live happily ever after because I'm trying to imagine what we'll have if this is what we need here in uh, the region to say we're sorry and everything will be okay. Well, first of all, we are looking forward to the times in which Israel is going to plead sorry for what we did to the Palestinians, but it is uh, something that we envisage only in the far future. But uh, in uh, other cultures, mainly cultures that are influenced by Christianity, this is something that you expect to happen. This is not the end. This is the beginning of a process. And uh, it's very hard to ask for this kind of being sorry for apology uh, when you talk about, uh, let's say, the cultures of the Far East. This is why it took so much time for the Japanese to do it. The Japanese had a problem which the Germans didn't have. And uh, they, they arrived, at, arrived at a moment when they said, OK, we are sorry, we pay compensations, but this is the only, only the beginning of a process that they had to go on. And we're seeing this process happening basically in Germany and maybe between Germany and Israel. About until today, we're seeing that Germany still apologizes for what happened in World War II, of course paying uh, uh, money to uh, all the Holocaust survivors. And until now, you can still hear the mistrust between sometimes Israelis and Germans, still Israelis. Some Israelis feel uncomfortable to go to Germany, don't feel comfortable enough to be there, to hear the German language. So it's not only a process of like you're saying, to just it's a long process, not just saying, I'm sorry, and that's it. It's also about um, building the um, trust between the two sides. And it's, it's actually a psychological, maybe a treatment that uh, people need to go through in order to get to the, let's say, so-called peace. Yes, I uh, certainly agree with uh, Professor Zimmerman. I think uh, you might say it's only apologizing, but it's a very big thing. And the manifestation of this is why it, uh, it was hard for uh, Japan uh, to apologize for many years. And as Professor Zimmerman said, it's a uh, part of the process, the beginning. It's accompanied by reparations, often by changing of uh, textbooks, all kinds of cultural uh, exchanges. Etc. So this, and it takes time. Um, I should just mention that with regard to Japan, it already had apologized since the 1980s about the various atrocities it had conducted uh, against various Asian countries in general. And since the 1990s until today, maybe 10 times, apologizing specifically to Korea about the comfort women issue. And still, it is very a uh, sensitive topic. Uh, uh, for various reasons, to some degree because various politicians in Japan, uh, when they come to power, they kind of uh, retreat from the apology that was uh, expressed by the previous uh, leaders, or people from the society or from other parties, they say, trying to diminish the, uh, the, the implication of the apology. 
So this is why it still remains, on the one hand, it still remains a sensitive topic, and on the other hand, if I might say just very carefully, I am not sure it's the last uh, echoed of this sensitive issue, because, as I said, already about 10 times, there have been apologies uh, expressed by Japan. No, I'm, if I'm looking at the United States and the, the, the let's say, uh, the process that the United States is uh, going uh, through um, between in, on the issue of African American and the white uh, uh, men in uh, the United States, this is a process that the United States is still living since slavery until today. We are talking about 2015 that people are going out on the streets and talking about racism in the United States that um, still people don't think that it's uh, relevant. So how come until today, after everything that we're seeing, after we're seeing that history sometimes repeats itself or stays with us, how come it, other countries are not learning from what they saw or from what they are experiencing or from what they experienced in the past? As I said before, it is a question of cultures. The Christian culture is always open for repentance, for being sorry, for apologies. It's not the same with other cultures. So if you look at the Christian world, you can see how this process began in the United States. It was effective also in South Africa. And the example I know best, the example of Germany, is, I think, really exemplary, because they understood already right after the Second World War, that they have to repent. And they approached the Jews, the representatives of the Jews, and they found out something that the Japanese didn't believe in and do not believe in, that this is a, it is a merit, it is a, even an advantage, even politically an advantage. The Israelis, as representatives of the Jews, were ready to forgive. And Israel is having normal relations to Germany of today. This is something that was based on this approach of the Germans. Yes, we are sorry for what we did, and now you can look uh, at us as repentant uh, folks and uh, cooperate exactly, with us. It's exactly on this point when the Germans are saying, forgive me, Father, for I have sent, because I have sent and I have sent, and, and, and we, we, are, we are apologizing. But today you are hearing criticism in Germany that basically comes that enough apologizing. We cannot continue apologizing each and every day about what happened in World War II. We also need to look on uh, and to look at, uh, to the future and this apology constant apology is taking us backwards and not forward well it becomes to a certain extent a backlash if you exaggerate apologizing then of course some people will say enough is enough in german you call it schlussstrich we have to put a, a let's say a, an end to the discussion about what we did. But the fact that they exaggerated doesn't say that they were, uh, uh, let's say, doing the wrong thing uh, all over the years, because it was effective. It is effective within German society. German society did learn from the past. This is exactly your point. They did learn from the past. They know uh, what uh, racism, anti-democracy may do to a society. And they do it also vis-a-vis uh, -vis other people and found out that it's uh, for them politically, internationally, an advantage. And this is why the Chinese, for instance, uh, just try to learn from the example made by uh, the Germans and the Jews. When I was in China, I was three times in China for this purpose. They invited me together with a German colleague just to show how it functions. The Chinese, not only South Koreans, have a long reckoning with the Japanese, and they show the Japanese, well, see how it works, how it functions, do it with us. And not only works, it works in the ec uh, economy, and uh, it works on the cultural level, and it works on so many level. But, this, you know, I want to take this and, and to take it to the United States. And what is the interest? Because saying you're sorry always has a hidden interest sometimes uh, behind it. So this time we're seeing maybe the interest of the United States to take these two uh, countries back, uh, let's say, to warm up the relationship between the two countries. And it's, can we say that it's an honest sorry when can 
we say that there is an honest sorry when there are so many interests, geopolitical interests and economic interests and, and so on and so on. So apologies will they generally, typically, will be motivated by two, one of the two or two motivations. One is moral interest, and you know, we can believe some people in some countries also have oh, moral yeah. interest in apologizing, uh, and also interest, and or interests. Um, and you know, I cannot specifically say about every specific leader that apologized or not, but as we, as we read and we know with regard to this apology uh, between uh, of Japan to Korea, there was also the interest of trying to warming up the relations with in, to confront the threat of the neighboring uh, China. You know, uh, saying you're sorry, is sometimes it's a, a one step uh, towards building some kind of trust uh, that was uh, lost. Uh, one of the examples that I can uh, that, that just I can recall from just uh, the recent years uh, is uh, Ruby Rivlin going to uh, Kifur Qasim and uh, recognizing the Kifur Qasim uh, genocide and saying that Israel was wrong. A lot of people criticized uh, Ruby Rivlin, uh, President Ruby Rivlin, for doing that, but a lot of people said this is the first step to bring the people together. When somebody is doing that, what are the chances that the people, after so many years of lack of trust, will, at the, at the end of the day, come back and will start building these steps of trust? Yeah. Well, you know, we cannot, I don't think you can talk about chances. I think it's a factor that promotes the chances that reconciliation between the rival parties will be achieved. It depends, of course, if the people think it's sincere morally or it's only for interest-wise, and also with regard to other manifestations of uh, regret, with regard to reparations and uh, things like this. But anyway, I think it's a, an important factor in promoting the chances for reconciliation, because I just want to put all this apology issue in the uh, wider context of reconciliation. Since the 1980s and more from the 1990s, it was realized that resolving conflict or the end of genocide, colonialism, um, etc., and dictatorial regimes, finishing, uh, signing a peace agreement or finishing the violence will not ha finish with the psychological uh, maltreatment and the after, uh, difficult aftermath. And this is why in conflict resolution studies and international relations, they develop the concepts of reconciliation and peace building. And apology is one of the methods in reconciliation, meaning healing the relations. But when the narratives are so different, like, for example, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we're talking about not only a regular conflict, not only a conflict about the land, we're talking about the conflict of narratives. And when the narratives are so different, one. Uh, nation is thinking that way and the other one is thinking that way. One nation has an historical memory on a specific issue and the other one has something uh, di totally different. How can you even start uh, bringing or for some kind of reconciliation between the two sides? Well, as I said, it's a matter of culture and a matter of education. The and moment... The cultures are so di different and similar at the yeah, same time. At least in the Jewish culture, you have this element of repentance, of showing uh, that you are sorry for something that you did which was unjust. What uh, Rivlin stands for is this awareness that Israel did wrong to the Palestinians, that Israel did wrong to those specific uh, Arabs in Kfar Qasim, and this is why he asked uh, for, for apology or asked for uh, the understanding at least of the Israeli society that this was wrong. Well, the, the criticism is based on the false awareness that Israel is always on the right side. And this is why it shouldn't ask, uh, or shouldn't be sorry for anything it did in the past. This, is, uh, this shows us that the Israeli society is not mature enough uh, compared to the American society when it reckons with the uh, past of slavery, German, uh, German society, or even French society, when they think about the time of the Second World War or the first part of the 20th century. What are the chances that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, can be resolved? 
can be resolved, it's a more political issue. With regard to clashes of historical narratives, I would like to say that it depends about which topics. In every conflict, you have dozens of major events and topics. So it depends about which topic. For example, with regard to the major topic of the 1948 Palestinian exodus that led to the creation of the Palestinian refugee problem. Uh, apparently, there is not such a very big gap, because in my studies I found that all this, that about the vast majority of studies of Israeli Jewish scholars published since the late 1970s already include a, a narrative that says that some of the Palestinians in 48 that became refugees were expelled, and some were uh, left on their own will. Mm, so, even in the 50s. Yeah. But it was. Yes, so I just want to say there's not such a big gap about every topic. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much for mm -hmm. this insightful conversation. Thank you very much for coming here. That's it for tonight. Tomorrow we'll be here again at the same time, same place. From the Jeff Port Israel, have peace. Have a great night.